So in the morning, we discussed mainly how to guard and if you like, protect our minds through the use of skillful perceptions and thoughts and ways of attending to whatever experience is right in front of us or whoever is in front of us. Uh, whatever, you know, contact comes in at these five sense doors and also the door of the mind, particularly the thoughts at this stage, because the Buddha said that the mind is basically obscured by these five senses. Like as long as the five senses are very strong, we don't really see the nature of the mind. And there's a lovely simile that my teacher Ajahn Brahm gives about her, let's call it an empress wearing lots of clothing. <laughs> so this empress is wearing very tall boots that go from the feet right up to over the knees. And that's the first garment. Then they have another garment of some kind of trousers or in America, they call them pants. <laughs> Shouldn't say that here though. It needs a bit more than a pair of pants. Anyway, and they go up to the waist. And from there on, there's a jacket that comes down over the rim of the trousers and covers the skin and goes all the way up to the neck, right up to here. And then there are two very long gloves, the kind you wear when you're a teenage punk, and they go up all the way to the top of your arms. And of course, on the top, you wear this hat, but the hat is more than a hat. It's actually a complete covering of the face. And we have no idea who that empress is. It could be any one of us. It could be male, female, transgender person, or a gender non-binary person, or it could be an old or a young or rich or an able-bodied or less able-bodied person. It could be anyone at all. We don't know because they're covered up with these five thick garments and these are compared to the five senses. And it's only underneath those garments that the mind is there. And some places in the suttas, the Buddha refers to the mind as being radiant, pabasara, um, when it the um, five senses are removed when they're in abeyance for some while, that the, the chitta, the, the mind, is luminous and radiant. And of course, this isn't the ultimate nature of mind, at least I hope that's an of course in everybody's mind, because the mind also is subject to the laws of impermanence and also uh, is made up of many mind moments, many different consciousnesses arising and passing away, but at least in the beginning stages when the mind is uh, revealed for the first time behind these five senses, it appears radiant and very bright because the mindfulness is getting empowered. So we already discussed how to protect the mind and how to keep those uh, grosser hindrances and grosser impacts of the senses um, to some extent at bay. And this is a little bit like the fire's burning already, right? The senses are burning with greed, hate, and delusion, or let's say desire, aversion, and confusion, uh, slightly more moderate words. Um, and we're just trying to redirect the course of that fire. But the next part is about cooling those senses down, quietening them down to the point that they almost disappear or become very, very um, weak, if you like, so that we can start to see the power of the mind. And that's more like pouring water on the flames, cooling them off, and eventually even removing the source, the fuel for that fire altogether by looking at where that greed uh, or desire and wanting aversion and delusion comes from. What is the source? So bit by bit, we're getting closer to the actual contact of the senses with their objects to that point of contact from where all the reactivity begins. And this is where we start to develop stronger mindfulness. Yeah? Stronger mindfulness is needed in order to see that. And uh, even though the Buddha said that in the gradual training, we begin with sila of the body and speech, and then the sense restraint, the virtue, if you like, of the mind, and eventually the mindfulness that all feeds into empowering mindfulness. He also said that uh, it's due to a lack of mindfulness that we don't have enough restraint. And it's due to a lack of restraint that we break our sila. So in other words, the reverse is true as well. We need mindfulness to have sense restraint. We need sense restraint to have virtue. So it's like the three kind of cycle around one another and build each other up. So you can start in your daily life with your sila, 
which is advisable all along the path. And at the same time, we can go straight into the meditation and that will help us see where we're slipping, see where we're likely to get sucked in, if you like, to the defilements or to a course in the mind, which is not very wholesome to travel. So we can come in at any place and in a retreat situation, it's a wonderful opportunity to actually start to uh, build that mindfulness. Yeah. So we've tidied our cupboards in our daily life, uh, hopefully to some extent. So now you sit down and you open your cupboard. There might still be a bit of junk in there, but generally speaking, you can see where the clothes are that you can wear. You can see where the meta is. You can see where you keep uh your face and you can take that down if you need a bit of face you can see maybe there's some contentment in there you can take that out when you're feeling restless etc so you know a little bit how to use the mind how to uh, find the things in your cupboard so to speak and the main thing is it doesn't all fall out on top of you and kind of suffocate you hopefully that won't happen so <laughs> um what I wanted to talk about, first of all, I want to talk about three main areas here. The first one is about uh, dealing with thoughts. The second one is about cultivating equanimity towards the feelings that arise related to these sense inputs. And lastly, contentment. So there's just different tools that came to mind to help you cool and, and calm and quieten the senses today. So whatever again, works or resonates for you is a good one to uh, to take in. And don't try to take in every detail because you'll probably have a headache just like I usually do when I'm thinking about these talks. <laughs> so um, in the first place, when we sit down and we close our eyes, many of the senses are already quiet and simply because we're not looking, we're not really tasting anything. There's not hopefully too much noise around you. Of course, we have sensations in the body, feelings in the body, which can be fairly loud. But the main thing we start to notice is our thinking mind. And it can be an insight to notice that all thoughts, almost exclusively, unless they're complete sort of fantasies or I don't know what, um, actually pretty much all thoughts, including fantasies, are about the five sense world especially if that's all you know. <laughs> I mean, perhaps some of you have experienced deep states of meditation and you might suddenly see the mind very bright and blissful. But for most of us, when we close our eyes and thoughts arise, they're about the five sense world. They're about things that are, are very transient, but actually are not happening right now. They're just memories of that five sense world or fantasies of what might happen later in that five sense world. Or maybe they're kind of uh, memories that arise of, of things that have really impacted you, you know, and uh, you actually think you're remembering that event, but really you're remembering the last time you remembered that event. Because the further the time passes, the further away from that reality we become. And since then, the mind has been spinning many, many stories. Yeah. I have a friend who's currently in Australia. And she's uh, on this long retreat. I guess she didn't have to sort of call it a retreat, but basically she has the opportunity to be two months in the bush. And it's a stunning part of Tasmania. Really, really beautiful. She sent me the photos and, oh, you know, my eyes popped out. and <laughs> I did notice some breed arise. Um, and she says that, uh, you know, it's just the most incredible conditions. But inside her mind, she's feeling quite a lot of anxiety and disconnect and she says wow this isn't how I expected it to be you know I thought that I'm in such a beautiful place I can see that it's peaceful I can see that it's quiet but you know inside there's a lot of other stuff going on and she had this insight she realized that the main source of suffering there was not what was happening inside but wanting it to be different right not wanting it to be that way but the other thing she realized is that uh the idea of retreat is just a fantasy. You know, we think retreat's going to be this way or that way. We're going to get peace. We're going to get quiet. But actually, retreat is something altogether different. And it reminded me of something the Buddha said, which is however we think it's going to be, it will always be something different. And that's just a general rule of life, isn't it? 
you know, because any thought, even if kind of it's close to what actually happens, a thought is a very different experience than from than a lived experience. A thought is very one dimensional, isn't it? And life happens in 3D. So, you know, we sort of think we're getting close with thinking, but actually we're still far away. And again, I heard a very interesting quote from some famous psychologist recently that said something like, it's very hard to give up, give up things that almost work. <laughs> it's very hard to give up things that almost work. And it's like that with fantasy or it's like that with, I don't know, addiction to anything, right? Even kind of certain personality traits we might think we have, you know, maybe that we're the pleaser or the giver or whatever it is. And we think that if we just carry on, then we're going to somehow, you know, make everybody love us and be happy ever after. And it's like it almost gets there, but it doesn't quite work. But because it's so close, it's hard to give it up. <laughs> and it's the same with thinking, isn't it? We're sort of addicted to those thoughts. So we start to see, you know, that these thinking, these thoughts are very unreliable. And when they are um, fueled or when they're of the nature of greed or desire, aversion or, or confusion, you know, lots of kind of wanderings in the mind, not just wandering away, but wondering, is it this, is it that, should I do this, should I do that? Then it's even less likely that we're seeing the truth because those hindrances by themselves distort perception, they distort the truth. The Buddha said that the five hindrances, um, what does he say? Obstruct wisdom and nourish delusion. So that's why they're called nivaranas in Pali. It literally means the curtains or the obscurations of the mind. We don't see things clearly. We're seeing through curtains, you know, it's like there's a mist in front of our eyes. So we kind of see shapes and we see sort of what we think is a person, but we only see it in a distorted way. A bit like when a burglar comes in. I once did that as a joke, not burgled anyone, but put a kind of tights over my head with my sister to see how we'd look in the face gets all kind of all distorted. And it's a, it's a bit like the hindrances. We're not seeing, you know, the face of things clearly. So the Buddha said that uh, the first thing that's important to do with the thinking is a little bit to rein it in. To rein it in. So he gives this lovely simile of um, a cow herd who sits on top of the mountain and these cows have gone all over the place. They've gone on down the hill, up the hill, behind him. I know maybe they're in the trees. That's goats, isn't it? But you know, they could be anywhere. The cows are all over the place. So the first thing he has to do is rein them in, bring them in. And that's what we were doing a bit by cultivating more wholesome qualities. And in this case, we can cultivate more wholesome thoughts. So that's the first step. You know, we try to uh, replace a thought of ill will with a thought of loving kindness. We can replace a thought of cruelty with a thought of compassion, you know, um, a thought of maybe impatience with a reminder to just relax and let the process unfold. Um, also, another aspect of right thought is thoughts of renunciation. So this can either be a thought of letting something go, or it can actually be a kind of stepping back from the thought to observe it, you know, to just get some space, some perspective around that thinking mind and stop fueling it with greed, hate and delusion. Just stand back coolly. And that's an aspect of equanimity as well. Like equanimity can be defined as just looking on, just looking on. It literally means this, oop means like uh, from above kind of thing. Um, or is it? Yeah. And peka means like uh, looking, right? So looking from above, if you like, or looking on, looking over. So it gives us a sense of perspective and the thoughts can start to calm. And when this starts happening, that that's, it's a natural process. It's, you know, nothing we can strive for, nothing we should kind of push away. But we do start to notice that uh, thinking, even wholesome thoughts, is still an irritation on peace. And so the Buddha points out in this particular sutta, the, it's not the cow sutta, but <laughs> it's called the Dveda Vitaka Sutta. It's Majjhima number 19. Uh, he points out that even though there's no danger and nothing to be feared in thinking wholesome thoughts, for example, thoughts of loving kindness or uh, compassion, 
um, thoughts in line with Dhamma, perhaps, you know, all the different things you want to uh, share about your retreat. There's nothing unwholesome, but the danger is that it drains, it tires the mind. If we do it excessively, it tires the mind. And he says that when the mind is tired, it's far away from stillness. It's far away from samadhi. And I think the, one of the reasons for that is that thoughts are still um, a dual. There's a duality there. There's the, the one thinking and there's the thought. So there's a lot of diversity there. And here we're aiming to bring the mind to unity um, by really calling it down. So, you know, I have this experience myself, like, in the monastery, I'm supposed to be the leader here because I started this thing. So it's my own karma. <laughs> so uh, we just have a small monastery in Oxford. It's the first time women have had somewhere that we can uh, train to be full, fully ordained in the Buddhist monastic tradition in this country. Sadly, incredible that it's the first opportunity, you know, in, in a supposedly a gender equal society. Um, so starting it was very difficult. There was a lot of work involved and I still find myself very busy throughout the day. And recently I was really uh, tired and um, suffering from some health problems. And I said to my uh, guests, you know, could I just disappear for a couple of days and just be quiet, you know, so that I can prepare myself for some meditation retreats and some teaching. And they were very supportive and got on with everything fine without me. I'm sure we all enjoy it very much. And uh, I noticed that even within a morning, my thinking became much clearer and I had all kinds of inspirations and uh, ideas just because the mind wasn't drained by talking too much. Yeah. And then at the other level, you know, still you're, you're thinking, right? But uh, once I was in a retreat in Australia, where I go every year for my three months reigns, and the thoughts actually stopped for like quite a few days, which is not that common for me unless I'm in a really long retreat. Um, but it really stopped. And there was just so much happiness filling the mind because the mind wasn't, you know, leaking its energy on other things and so all this energy started to pour into mindfulness and to pour onto the breath and bliss was just coming up and coming up and a peaceful kind of really satiating bliss and uh and then over time you know after i don't know 10 days or so it started to fade and just a few thoughts started coming back in the mind i was fine with that you know because these things are um experienced through letting go not through craving so I was fine with that. There was lots of equanimity and the thoughts were coming, let them go, nothing unwholesome. But to my amazement, I needed an extra hour's sleep when the thoughts started coming back. <laughs> and so I realized what the Buddha meant, you know, by the thoughts just tiring the mind. And of course, you know, the mind wasn't in such deep samadhi at that time, but of course you can still practice very well with whatever situation you find in your mind. But it was very interesting just to see the truth of that. So we can learn to bring our senses inward and sort of calm the thinking mind in our daily life, even if we get just a moment to spare. Yeah, One of the things we do in the monastery and we were doing just now while eating lunch is that we restrain our senses to the point that we just focus on one thing. So at lunchtime, we tend to eat in silence and some of us close our eyes so we can just focus on the food, focus on the taste and the flavors and notice any reaction to that, you know. And I think this really helps, especially with a couple of us here who have digestive issues, and it really helps, you know, to get those juices flowing in the digestive system and just to, you know, keep the mind kind of um, grounded and settled and, and focused on one thing. And these are all ways that we can just quieten down our senses in our daily life. So certainly, you know, to look at how you're talking, look at how you're thinking and see if it's really necessary and just see if you can quieten it down. But in the meditation itself, we use wisdom to help with this. You know, wisdom is really, I suppose, one of the hearts of the Buddhist path. Often I say loving kindness is the heart of the Buddhist path, but they're all aspects of the same thing. But certainly wisdom and understanding is a very wonderful motivation for practice. Because when you're meditating to understand, 
rather than to experience this or that, whether it's peace or equanimity or however beautiful it is, if we're just practicing to understand, then there can't really be any good or bad meditation. You know, it's all about what we learn from our mind. And so there's this very beautiful sutta that I wanted to share with you about how to understand what's happening with the senses and how to um, cultivate equanimity based on that wisdom, based on that understanding. And what I like about this is it doesn't only talk about uh, cultivating equanimity, but it talks about noticing the peace of equanimity. So it's almost like learning to get a taste for a different kind of happiness, like a subtler kind of happiness, the peace and the happiness of equanimity. Because sometimes we think equanimity is a bit dull or bland, and it's like, just be economists, <laughs> plod through life, you know, very even and mustn't show any emotion. That's not equanimity, you know, equanimity includes everything, but it just looks on. But sometimes it can look on with peace. Sometimes it can even look on with contentment, which I think is another nuance, you know, of equanimity. One that my teacher actually likes to translate it as these days. He actually translates upeka, looking on as contentment, which is pretty wise, actually. There's a lot of wisdom in that um, because it does focus on the nourishing aspect of these qualities like equanimity and peace. The fact that there's a happiness there, there's something fulfilling there that we can't really find in the world of the senses. So I'm going to read a passage, and it's from Majjhima Nikaya number 152. If people are interested in the suttas, you could let the hosts know at the end, and I could actually give a list of the ones we've used today, because it is a nice way in. You know, when you're learning the suttas in a practical manner, like how it relates to your meditation, it's a nice way into reading some of those suttas for yourself. And the Buddha's words are always the best. You know, I'm just giving my limited understanding of these things according to my limited practice. But when you start to get a taste for the Buddha's teachings from the source, it really does open up a very wide um, treasure trove, really, of wisdom and guidance that you can rely on, right? Because you don't know when teachers come to your sessions. Hopefully they're well trained and they have good virtue. But, you know, you know that the Buddha, hopefully you have that faith that the Buddha was enlightened. He knew something more than most of us. So anyway, I'm going to read this out about um, one way to develop the senses and to understand sense restraint in practice. So the Buddha says, now Ananda, and Ananda is his uh, disciple, his cousin. How is there supreme development of the faculties, that's the sense faculties, in the noble one's discipline in the Buddha's teaching? Here, Ananda when a monastic or anybody else sees a form with the eye, there arises what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. And there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. Now, usually it says there arises what is neither nor, <laughs> neither agreeable nor disagreeable. But I think, you know, it's very similar. I haven't read the footnote, I have to confess. But um, basically it's something that's not really either. In other words, something in between. So these don't come in strict categories. It's kind of a, a trajectory, isn't it, of pleasure and pain. One understands thus, there has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen what is disagreeable. And there has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen, this is peaceful, this is sublime equanimity. So we're contrasting something here. We're seeing on the one hand, what has arisen at the level of the senses has to be either agreeable, disagreeable, or somewhere in between, right? But that is conditioned, gross, and dependently arisen. Whereas equanimity is peaceful and sublime. So this is a kind of nudging of the mind in a different direction through using wisdom and again not judging but just noticing the nature of these things so we see that it's condition grows dependently arisen that means it's not reliable right something that's conditioned arises from a cause 
That's what dependently arisen means. It's dependent on a cause. If that cause isn't there, the arising of that phenomenon isn't there, right? So, and it's gross. When it arises, it's kind of compacted, it's solid. It doesn't mean it's gross as in it's disgusting. It just means it's um, coarse. You know, it's not something refined. Um, it's something that we've kind of fabricated. For example, if you see a site, you see a person, right? Or you see a tree. That's a concept, that's a fabrication, that's something we've called an assemblage of, I don't know, wood and leaves, and if you go deeper, particles, etc. You know, that's an assemblage of parts. And we see it as a solid object, which it really isn't. So, and also it's conditioned in the sense that it's only based on having, uh, say, an eye, and that eye coming in contact with a form, that there can be contact and that because of that contact there can be consciousness it's only because of that if you don't have an eye or if there are no forms and you don't see anything then there's no seeing so in that sense it's conditioned too and furthermore the feeling that arises is conditioned like i might see a tree and think it's beautiful you might see one and not even know well you might not even notice it or not see it right or with a person, you know, I see someone and they're my best friend, someone else sees them as an enemy. It's uh, very, very subjective and based on that pleasure or pain, you know, pleasant or painful feelings will arise, agreeable or disagreeable feelings will arise. And even the way we react to those feelings is conditioned, you know, if we've been taught that it's terrible to feel anxiety, for example, and it shows that you're weak, then you won't want to experience anxiety. It'll be like, oh, no, my whole world's crumbling. I have to be tough. I have to be strong. But for myself, I turned that one around sometimes in the beginning when I used to teach. And I was not a public speaker. I mean, I was terrified of speaking to people. It's only because you're all so lovely that I overcame that, really. But um, another way I overcame it was to see that the anxiety was a kind of an adrenaline. I just kind of re-perceived it sort of framed it differently and I saw that it was due to wanting to do a good job for example and I saw it as maybe something quite natural that would actually lead to me giving an okay talk so I started to see it as a sort of adrenaline that was part of a natural process and another way I guess that I've reframed the anxiety thing is that if you can kind of show up even when you have anxiety or a sense of vulnerability there's a certain authenticity to that which is a strength Actually, I love talking about this because I really think so-called vulnerability is actually a huge strength and it keeps you very open to others and allows other people to be vulnerable too and to be very honest and open. It's amazing when you start talking about some of these things, you know, for me at the moment, I'm talking quite a bit about um, hormones because I'm going through like a ridiculous hormone crash that's supposed to be yeah, my hormone levels are basically post-menopause, but I'm only in perimenopause, so there's almost nothing to keep me going. <laughs> and it's really bizarre because it feels like the whole body is like caving in on me. and I can't move sometimes. It's just weird. And then anxiety that's physiological comes up and I can't think or function really. And it, it's just bizarre. And by talking about it, I can see some of you nodding away. And it's just wonderful because I realize this is like, conditioned there's dependently arisen it's nothing to do with me it's literally just hormones it's like physiological and isn't that just such a relief because then we're not making a sense of self out of it out of a feeling that's completely out of our control so this is one of the things these things are conditioned and i love this sutta because it's saying you know because it's conditioned it can also cease right? It's not just that because it's conditioned, we can like change our relationship to it, but because it's conditioned, it actually does cease all on its own. So sometimes we don't have to be too bothered about these things, too worried about these things. We can just step back, observe, let them be, and let them pass, you know? When the cause for the arising of that has passed, then the result passes on all by itself. And there's a natural going out of the flame, if you like. There's a natural cooling off of the five sense doors. So the next lovely part of the sutta is that he gives similes for every single one of the oh. senses. Um, and he talks about how 
the senses are all impermanent as well and how understanding how impermanent well the senses but also the feelings that arise are also helps establish that equanimity so the next part goes like this just as a person with good sight having opened their eyes might shut them or having shut their eyes might open them so too concerning anything at all the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable arose, that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly. Yeah. It's almost like they arise and they're gone within an instant. Just as rapidly, just as easily. And equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's discipline, the supreme development of the faculties regarding forms cognizable by the eye. So the thing here is that we see a form. For example, we have the sensations, the pleasant, unpleasant aspect of those uh, feelings arising. We understand they've arisen. We understand the nature of what's arisen, but then we see this is conditioned, this is gross, it's dependently arisen. Whereas equanimity is peaceful, equanimity is sublime. And further, we understand, we see that impermanence of these things, and we see how it ceases just as quickly as it's arisen. And so too, at that point, equanimity is established. And I have a lot of experience of this myself from my um, Vipassana practice over many, many years. Um, I started in 96 in India, and that was my main practice for probably 14, 15 years of my practice life. And, um, you know, you would really go to the nature of these sensations. So rather than just see, is it pleasant, is it unpleasant, you'd be going right into it and seeing all kinds of different um, feeling tones arising and passing so quickly sometimes that it was hard to even catch up with them with the mind. And they would just literally seem to be vanishing before they'd kind of even... Sometimes just all that you could see was the vanishing. And the Buddha kind of gave these lovely similes like uh, that sensations in the body are like uh, mustard seeds popping in the pan. Like boop, 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 boop. <laughs> you have to put the lid on or it goes all over the kitchen. People don't always realize. <laughs> and take it off the heat because they start going really quick. And um, another one that I like is like sand banks, you know, and there's like banks of sand and they just start falling in. You know, and sometimes that's how my experience would feel, like everything just falling, falling, falling the whole time. And when it's that way, there's nothing you can really uh, stay with long enough for craving or aversion to arise because there's no space actually for that reaction to happen when you're really with the, the feeling as it arises. So in a sense, I think this practice of, you know, noticing what's coming in at the sense doors and noticing the feeling that arises, it's like getting closer and closer and closer to the source of where the, the craving, the desire, the aversion arises from. So we're getting really to the heart of the matter, to the source. As the Buddha said, the, these five senses, the six senses, including the mind of the world. So we're looking at the origin of this world, how it's being formed, how it's being recreated again and again and again. So I'll just go through the other similes because they're really beautiful. And, uh, and then I'll talk a bit about contentment. So he says, for sound, it arises and ceases just as quickly. So just as quickly as a strong man might snap his fingers, sound arises and ceases, or the feelings as a result of sound arise and cease just as quickly and equanimity is established. So we can think we know this, but we get so upset when somebody says something unkind, but it's gone in a moment. It just only continues on in the mind, right? When we don't restrain our mind. Smell is like raindrops on a sloping lotus leaf. Sorry, as raindrops on a sloping lotus leaf drop off, the sensations arise and cease just as quickly. That reminds me of being in India and you walk past these piles of rubbish which are just strewn all along the roads from time to time and it really, really honks, you know, it's really quite strong. My dad came to visit me and he kept pulling all these amazing faces. <laughs> because the nose sense door was kind of burning with aversion. 
But then you walk around the corner and there's incense going on or there's a flower market and you can smell this incredible fragrance of really rich and nuanced, you know, just around the corner. And uh, I don't know what a lot of energy is wasted on. <laughs> uh, and then flavor, he says, it's uh, just as someone might spit out spittle. That's how quick the sensations around flavor arise and cease. So for monastics, we just mix all ours in a bowl. <laughs> now that I have Venerable Lepeka here, she's a wonderful nun from Perth, originally Sri Lankan, and we both have this very deep connection to India. So we eat with our hands and we mix it all up, you know. It's actually really nice because, well, I don't think it necessarily brings out the flavour, but it causes a really nice relationship with your food that happens even before it reaches the tongue, you know. And so you feel very connected with what you're eating. But yeah, you, you just sort of get a sense of how much to eat in, a, in each morsel. But you're less focused on the flavor because you mix it up. And then he said that uh, touch, physical sensations arise and cease as quickly as one extends a flexed arm or flexes an extended arm. And physical sensations are really kind of one interesting place to ground our awareness and I think that's why so many meditation traditions teach body awareness because even the other senses do have an effect on the sensations we feel in our body so if you see something beautiful it sends a kind of pleasant feeling through the body actually it doesn't only stay at the level of the eye it actually creates a pleasant feeling all over and I've noticed that on long retreats, you know, starting to raise my eyes and look at a tree and I get this room of pleasant sensations. I like trees. <laughs> and uh, for me, it was quite insightful to realize, you know, from, from that sort of practice that whenever I like or dislike, say, a person, I guess it's easier to use examples of people because this is where most of our troubles lie. It's actually nothing to do with the person. It's everything to do with the way they make you feel. <laughs> in other words, not even they make you feel, it's everything to do with the feelings that as arise when you see or speak with that person or maybe get pushed about by that person physically. It's the feeling that arises in you that you're reacting to. And in the suttas, there's a lovely example. There was a queen called Malika, and she was married to King Pasendadi, who was, uh, he was a disciple of the Buddha. It took him a while, but he was a disciple. Uh, but Queen Malika was a much um, bigger disciple. Like she was really a sincere Buddhist and uh, a devotee, let's say, of the Buddha's teaching. So she practiced the path. And uh, one day she was looking from her balcony and uh, the Buddha walked by and she was gazing at him in adoration, as you would if a Buddha walked by. Um, and the king came up and saw her gazing at the Buddha this way. And he said, Malika, who do you love most in the world, me or the Buddha? <laughs> he got jealous. <laughs> and Malika was very, very wise. And, and she was with her sensations. She was with her inner experience. And she said, more than the both of you, I love myself. Because what she was saying there is that it's the feeling that arises that we love. It's nothing to do with the person outside. If it is, it's very transient because your feelings around the same person are going to change all the time. You're going to be so confused about whether you get on with them or not, right? Because one day <laughs> you have great lovely sensations in their company. The next day you feel agitated, you feel irritated. It's only to do with your reactivity to what you're feeling inside. You know, it doesn't mean we don't ask people and point out to people that, you know, maybe there's something in their behavior that's hurting or harming us in some way. But, you know, we do learn to work with what's happening inside and then we don't need to be, there's not so much business in that outside world. Ah, oh, what a relief. So this is how we can work with the senses. We're starting to step back. We're looking on. We're noticing the happiness of equanimity and the relief of that, how it cools down these reactivities in our mind. And of course, when we do that, our mindfulness gets empowered, you know, because equanimity is like a quality of the mind. So we're getting more and more into uh, noticing the qualities of the mind and allowing them to brighten up in time. 
So just to finish lastly about, uh, oh, I didn't say about the mind though. I'll just give the simile for the mind before I finish because the mind is the quickest actually of all those senses. And that one is just like two or three drops of water on a heated iron plate evaporate. So the mind objects, if you like, thoughts, etc., or states of mind disappear, cease as quickly as they arise and equanimity is established. So you really can't keep up. And the Buddha actually said, because the mind is so fast, it's better to think of the body as self than the mind. I mean, neither of the self. And there is no thing like a self, the way we understand it through our deluded minds. Uh, there's a process of mind and matter, of body, mind, perceptions, etc., feelings, etc. Um, but the mind is the quickest of them all. So it's important to work with the mind. And another lovely way to work with the mind, as I said, is to develop that contentment, yeah, to develop contentment with all our experience. And this means really being able to value the moment. So not just, okay, I can deal with you. I'm looking on kind of not really wanting you to be there, but I'll look on, I'll deal, I'll kind of put up with you so that you go away. That's not contentment. That's not even equanimity, right? Equanimity is very cool. But contentment is a little bit, um, it's a bit warmer. It's a bit more connected. And it makes it easier to stay in the present moment when we're content, when we value what's there. It's a really powerful antidote to wanting as well. And wanting is one of these fires of the senses. Uh, when we're content with something, we don't really want anything else, you know. Whenever we want something else, it means we're not content with what's here. We're wanting something that's not here. I mean, it sounds so obvious, right? But isn't that crazy? Like we only have what's here. So if we're wanting something that's not here, then we're suffering. We're creating suffering for ourselves. So one of the solutions to that is to want what's here. Like to actually be content with what's here because it's here. So how can we relate to it in a way that's kind, in a way that's loving, in a way that values what's arisen? Because that's the only place you can really work and develop wisdom. You, know, you can't really develop wisdom with imaginary objects. I mean, you can use skillful perceptions to change the way you maybe habitually look at things. But, you know, really, it's with what's arising now that we begin. Yeah. So the contentment is a really beautiful way of overcoming wanting. And we start to see that all wanting is suffering itself, you know, because... Even the habit of always wanting something that's not here, of course, is just create, is reinforcing that habit. It's again, like Ajahn Chah said, the tortoise, looking for the tortoise with the moustache. You're just always looking somewhere else for your happiness and never noticing the happiness that's here now. So contentment is like being happy to be here. Um, and at first it might sound a bit contrived, but over time it really does start to work because when you can stay present with whatever's here, you start to actually see the beauty in it, you know, or at least you see that it's not so bad and you see that you can like rest with it with a sense of acceptance. And after a while, things start to open up. Even the mind that you think is all over the place, you start to see the gaps in the thinking. You start to see the moments of silence that are there. And you start to be able to actually befriend that silence and rest in the peace, yeah? And bit by bit, the mind starts to get revealed. It starts to be brighter. And we are less and less drawn to the five sense world. So the Buddha gives this lovely simile of a tortoise. It's a tortoise again, but not with the, the one with the mustache. This is the tortoise that brings its limbs in. It has five limbs. That's like the five senses. He has his little head with his little face or her face and little... I was asking my venerable sister here, what are they called in a turtle? Paws? They can't be paws, right? I don't know what they are, flappers or something. And they have the back two as well, little limbs. And it's like the five sense world is this place where you're very likely to get sucked into greed and aversion and all the rest. So you pull them in. You just pull them in and you go into your shell. And this is what we can do, not in daily life, but in our retreat. We can just pull in a little bit, go inside and pull our limbs in. You know, in other words, withdraw a little bit, recede a little bit from the five sense world and start to find a comfortable place inside our shell. That means inside the home of the mind. And when we do that, it starts to feel more and more comfortable. 
So this is how we start to see the empress beneath the five layers of clothing. We start to stay there more and more with equanimity, with contentment, with peace. And the mind starts to be revealed. We start to shine up the lights of mindfulness. And when energy comes into the mind, the mind brightens and feels more content with itself. So I think that's plenty. <laughs> There's always a lot to say on these subjects because they're such big pieces. But I guess my main aim today is to point out that this uh, sense restraint, this way of working with the senses is a part of the practice as it's often not taught enough. We talk a lot about sila, we talk about mindfulness, but there's this place between the two, a huge scope for practice, a huge field of practice, which you can make use of in your everyday life by learning to look at things in more skillful ways. And then also in our meditation, learning to you know, notice what it's like when the senses recede and the mind starts to take over. So let's see if we can quieten our mind and quieten the senses down a little bit more and enjoy some peace of equanimity. <laughs>